Good morning, I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to our December Good Morning Metro South. On behalf of the Chamber Board of Directors, I want to wish you all the happiest of holidays. It's good to see so many expressions of the holiday this morning. I see lights. I didn't expect to see that today, but I'm glad to see it. I see hats. I see some beautiful sweaters, not ugly sweaters. Uh, I, had, I see some ties, some nice ties. And uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, participating in our in our event of the season, and I hope that you each get a little gift on the way in. For those of you who did not express any of the holiday spirit, we're still going to give you a little bonus on the way out, so make sure you stop uh, off and see. Get the bill? Get something that lights up, the, lights up your season. Uh, so we're delighted to be here at the Moakley Center. Uh, of course, the center was named after Congressman uh, Joseph Moakley, who served this region for many, many years. Uh, before his death, he uh, dedicated uh, some funds to build different facilities um, from his campaign funds that were left over uh, from a long, long career in politics. And this is one of the facilities that he uh, dedicated. There's another one over at Bridgewater State University with, that bears his name, and there are several other uh, wings and rooms and things like that. So we're very appreciative of, uh, of his commitment to our region. The reason I bring that up is our new chair, Fred Clark, actually served on his staff for many, many years. Uh, Fred is the president of Bridgewater State University now and couldn't be here this morning. But uh, I know he'd want me to uh, include in my comments uh, Congressman Moakley's contribution to this morning's program. I also want to thank, obviously, Good Samaritan Medical Center for hosting us. This is the second time this year that they've hosted us here, so we really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to hear from them in a little bit. But, Without further delay, we've got a great program uh, we want to get underway. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce RNC this morning, Dan Trout, uh, Senior Vice President of Commercial Lending for Mutual Bank. Dan. <laughs> Chris doesn't know it. I, he has a script up here. He made it. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been coaching basketball, so I've been uh, yelling at people. Uh, my voice a little hoarse. Chris has got a script up here. I brought, I brought my own, so he doesn't know that. So he's going to be sweating the whole program. It should be half uh, right. <laughs> thank you, Chris. I'd like to start by thanking uh, our chamber ambassadors in attendance today. Joanne, so if you just give a quick wave, uh, Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank. Murray Betstein, Source One, uh, Source Four. John King, Series Inc. And who else we got? Uh, Marty Dutton from Connemara Senior Living Campello. Brenda Karens, Elder Colony Elder Services. Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union. Catherine Light, Mansfield Bank. And Mark Diagnosino, Diaz Agnesino Insurance. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> I'd like to start, it's a little festive here, so we'll start with a quick little riddle. What did a gingerbread man use to make his bed? His bed. Cookie sheets. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, you gotta stay with the program here. I'm gonna check my I check my kids uh, choke book. I also like to thank uh, some of our elected officials that are in tent today, and I, I don't know if anybody's here. Is, is uh, Representative Claire Cronin here? No. Coming, coming. Coming. So she'll be here. So when she comes, we'll give her a round of applause. Yeah, that's right. And uh, City Councilor Ann Beauregard. And City Councilor Ann Beauregard. Is Ann here? Yeah. And she will. That's in the other script there. Okay, here we go. <laughs> So today's um, Good Morning Metro South is being hosted by Good Samaritan Medical Center, as Chris mentioned. Good Samaritan Hospital is acute care, 267-bed hospital providing comprehensive inpatient, outpatient, and level three trauma emergency services to Brockton and 22 neighboring communities. The hospital offers centers of excellence, excellence care in orthopedics, oncology, 
cardiology, and specialized care in surgery, family-centered obstetrics, uh, with level two nursery, substance abuse treatment, and advanced diagnostic imaging. So thank you again for, uh, for Stuart. Uh, joining us today to get this started is Rob Peters. And from Rob Peters Entertainment, we have none other than Rob Peters. So Rob. <laughs> I'd hope it'd be me. <laughs> How we doing this morning, everybody? Good. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Uh, you have to forgive me a little bit. Uh, unlike Dan, I actually did an event last night and got locked out of the venue for about 20 minutes at the end of the night, so I'm a little, uh, caught a little head cold. So uh, today's about networking, as well as all of the other things that we normally do on a Good Morning Metro South. So we're going to have a little bit of fun right now. And I like to look at networking as what I used to do as a kid around this time of year. My mom used to dress my sister and I up and take us to the mall for the visit with Santa. And that's kind of what we're going to do with our networking today. We're going to have a little bit of holiday fun. So everybody put your index finger up. On the count of three, you're going to point to someone at your table. Ready? One, two, three, point. <laughs> whoever, whoever has the most fingers pointed at their just put your hand up. I'm not going to embarrass you guys. All right. All of you with your hand up right now, what I'd like for you to do is you see those beautiful bags in the middle. I want you to kind of move those aside and you will find some holiday bows. Ooh. And everybody at the table, pick a bow, and please put it on your badge or on your clothes. If you don't want to do that, just hold it in your hand. Because what you're going to do today is when I give the go word, you're all going to stand up. You are going to go to a table other than your own. And you are going to find somebody with a matching bow. And you're going to strike up a conversation with them doing the following. You're going to introduce yourself and talk about who you are and what you do. Then it's going to be like that visit with Santa because you're actually going to tell the person you're talking to what your ideal referral would be, what you're looking for out of a referral. And then, just to have a little bit of fun and keep the conversation going and get to know each other a little bit better, you're going to talk about the best holiday gift you ever got. So to give me an example, Dan, can I borrow you for a minute? Mm -hmm. Sure. He had no idea I was doing this, by the way. So, <laughs> so to give you an example about how this is going to go is, hi, Dan, I'm Rob from Rob Peters hey, Entertainment. Rob. Nice to meet you. We specialize in corporate entertainment and entertainment of all types, but the one thing we do is we actually bring in an element of trivia and game shows to make events competitively fun. And my favorite gift as uh, when I grew up, actually, I got the best gift ever um, last Friday because we closed on our new house. And we were to thank. So um, that, that's my best gift. So uh, everybody's got their bow. Stand up. Go find somebody in the room to network with. Same color. Same color. Yes. <laughs> And don't forget to share business cards. So 
somebody just asked me and said, you did that whole thing with Dan, but you never talked about what your ideal referral was. So I'll share with the class real quick. Um, our ideal referral, by the way, is anybody who is doing an employee appreciation event in the first half of next year, anybody affiliated with an assisted or independent living facility or council on aging, or any corporate event planners. Okay, did you guys have fun? All right, let me give you, I have a gift for all of you, and that is, um, how many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay is if you may remember a few years back there used to be an app where you used to be able to take a picture of a business card and it would dissect the information for you and put it like in an excel spreadsheet and then that app disappeared it actually i found out the other day and i want to share this with you because i was really psyched i found out about it there's a new app out called evernote and it's free but there is a paid version that has that feature and you can do things like have it import your contacts into LinkedIn. So that's my gift to all of you. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. So before Rob sits down, we have a little parting gift for him. He didn't really let me speak before, so I'm not sure I should give this to him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we get going, uh, there are a couple board members I neglected to recognize here. So Masa Kababi is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From Kababi Immigration Law. Sorry about that. And Sue Joss, past chairman of the chamber, yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And Albert Sensei from Victory Human Services is here. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Matthew Hesketh, Vice President of Operations at Good Sam Medical Center. <coughs> Matthew joined Good Sam Medical Center in June of 2014 when he assumed the role of Director of Quality and Patient Safety. In July 2016, he was promoted to Vice President of Operations, and since that time he has led the Medical Center as a member of the Senior Leadership Team. He oversees multiple hospital departments, including perioperative services, cardiovascular <coughs> services, facilities, telecommunications, laboratory services, clinical engineering, and food services. So I sat with him just a minute ago and said, what don't you do? Yeah. <laughs> Please welcome Matthew Eskin. See the script now. <laughs> so, good morning everyone. I feel a little ill-prepared. I, I didn't come with a, a festive holiday tie or a riddle, uh, but hopefully we can uh, enjoy the time nonetheless. So, thank you all for, for coming this morning. On behalf of our president and chamber uh, board member Harrison Bain, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, welcome to Good Samaritan. Uh, we're very proud and pleased to have you here today. And just before we get started, I just want to recognize our uh, chairman of the board here at Good Samaritan, uh, Mr. Bob Gustafson. Board members are here. But um, it's really a great pleasure to have you all here today. For those of you who don't know, but you probably see on the uh, lunch boxes in front of you, we're celebrating our 15th year here at Good Samaritan on, the, on these grounds uh, this year in 2018. So it's really a tremendous milestone for us that we've uh, taken very seriously since the beginning of 2018 and have kind of celebrated in a variety of different ways uh, throughout the year. Uh, and I think there's really no more fitting capstone to our 50th anniversary and our, our 50th year here than to host this event here today and have uh, our local business leaders and community uh, leaders here to celebrate that with us and kind of give us an opportunity to demonstrate what we've been up to here where we've come from, where we're going, and how we see ourselves fitting into the Metro South uh, region. So to give you a little bit of history about Good Samaritan Medical Center, uh, 50 years ago, 1968, uh, this campus opened as the Cardinal Cushing Memorial Hospital. Um, many of you probably remember that. In 1994, the Goddard Hospital in Stoughton 
merged with Cardinal Cushing and created the Good Samaritan Medical Center. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, Good Samaritan Medical Center was purchased by Caritas Christi Healthcare, which was owned by the Roman Catholic Archdi Archdiocese of Boston. So we were one of six Catholic hospitals that made up that system. Uh, in 2010, we took a pivot. Uh, the system was not doing particularly well. And we partnered with Service Capital Management to create Steward Healthcare System. So Steward is, um, I'll get into it a little bit more in depth, but we are a for-profit, private healthcare system across the country and international at this point. So, you know, we've kind of come a long way and evolved, and our model is a little bit different than, than much of the uh, other healthcare systems within the state of Massachusetts, and quite frankly, um, we're morphing more into an, a, a national system in many ways, and that has a lot of advantages. But uh, we're very pleased and proud to be part of the Brockton healthcare community with Brockton Edward Healthcare, Signature Brockton Hospital, the VA. We really feel like we offer a pretty strong powerhouse of healthcare services to our communities, and it's, uh, it's a real testament to, I think, the, the economic and business community here to be able to support that on a consistent basis. So, who are we? Um, today we have about 2,000 employees here at the Medical Center. We have just over 600 physicians on our active medical staff. Uh, 600 of those 2,000 are registered nurses. We have 267 beds, as Dan mentioned. Um, 40 of those are actually located in Foxborough at the NorCap Lodge, which is a inpatient substance abuse treatment facility. Um, we think that that's a really strong component of our portfolio, given the current state of the opioid e epidemic uh, in our region. So that gives us some, some versatility there. Um, we have about 68,000 emergency room visits. Just to give you some context, so in, in the framework of our 50-year history, pretty much anything that wasn't built in 1968 we consider new, um, <laughs> including this room and uh, our emergency department, which we built in 2011. So in 2011, we built our emergency department basically uh, to house a patient volume of 55,000 visits. So since that time, we've grown exponentially year over year to get up to this where we're pretty much targeting 70,000 next year. Um, and we feel very comfortable that we're going to hit that. So, you know, the need for healthcare in our community is robust, and, you know, we're poised to meet that need on a consistent basis. We discharge about uh, 17,000 medical and surgical discharges annually. We do about 25,000 procedures in our operating suites and our uh, ambulatory procedure areas. We, this is timely, there was an article in the Enterprise yesterday about um, the top taxpayers in the city of Brockton and Good Samaritan uh, under our parent company is the top taxpayer, which we're proud of because that gives us a nice forum to reinvest in the community um, economically in a different way than most healthcare entities are able to do. And then we, um, as a system, in, in the Northeast Division, we give about five, five million annually and community benefits. So, um, you know, we look at ourselves as a community hospital at its core, but we really want to elevate that and take that to the next level. So our internal goal, and it's become our slogan, it ha is to become the premier regional choice for healthcare services in the region. Um, how do we do that? So it's kind of a, a multi-fold proposition. Number one, we need to be able to drive value to our consumers. I'm going to table that one until we get into the steward discussion. But value is critically important. Obviously, our market is extremely competitive. We have the powerhouse academic uh, teaching facilities downtown that have that uh, brand mystique and allure and just kind of uh, attract volume really out of our community. But why do we have to send our patients there? If we can provide a higher quality of care, a better patient experience, there's really no need for that vortex to continue to take our, our citizens, our um, business community members, your employees, my employees, our family members, and take them really out of the community when we can deliver equally, if not better, service here. So we really kind of focused on a few different service lines in the past year or two to really drive that value proposition uh, forward. 
we, in 2017, we were designated a level three trauma center um, by the American College of Surgeons, and by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Why is that significant? You know, we have all these level ones in Boston, true, but in EMS Region 5, good to have the Brewster team here, they uh, live this every day, but in EMS Region 5, which is basically 24 South Cape and the Islands, there are no level trauma centers. So if you have a traumatic event and you have uh, an injury that rises to a level where you need and require uh, a level trauma center, you have to either get med flighted to Providence or Boston, or you have a pretty long uh, ambulance ride, maybe even a ferry ride if you're on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. So what we wanted to do was really have a beacon of trauma care in the community, in Region 5, centrally located on tw right off of 24, that we could provide that service. So in 2017, we were awarded that designation. And since then, we've just really grown this program, invested a lot of money, a lot of resources. Um, and many of you have probably seen our trauma team extending out into the communities with your municipal departments, your fire departments, your police departments, uh, schools. They, they're doing a lot of outreach to really get the word out. But our, our trauma care has uh, really been exceptional. And over that two year period, we've been able to retain like 50% more of our trauma cases within the community. So we, we look at that as a real point of pride because we're keeping our community members in the community with incredible outcomes. Robotic surgery, I think is another uh, one I'd like to highlight this morning. Um, this is a, we're seeing robotic surgery as a real driving force of the younger generation of surgeons today. Most of them are using these techniques um, in, their, in their training. And some of our more seasoned, experienced surgeons are also getting into this as well. So we uh, have invested in the XI Da Vinci robot, which uh, I should have brought a video or one of our surgeons to demonstrate this to you. But basically it's like a video game console where you know, the surgeon is in there and all these probes are in the patient but it's a minimally invasive way of doing traditionally open procedures. <laughs> so faster recovery time, lower length of stay, better outcomes. <clears throat> Orthopedic Center of Excellence. Um, last year and in, in this year also, we pursued an accreditation with the Joint Commission uh, to, and the Joint Commission is an accrediting body that oversees all the, uh, the regulatory activities for the Center of Medica Medicare and Medicaid Services. They have certain um, service line distinctions that they'll come in and survey you if you have provided a program that has high quality outcomes and subscribes to the, the evidence-based processes. So we did that for our Orthopedic Center of Excellence and have continued to drive value there with significant growth in our program. Um, we're continuing to evolve that, bringing in new robotic techniques, the Mako robot, uh, and a variety of other different things. So just kind of a, that's a, a quick highlight of three of those service lines, but this is how we see ourselves uh, driving forward. It's by creating centers of excellence, by continuously providing that high quality care and distinguishing ourselves through the outcomes and the experience. Um, in addition to that, how do we support it? So, you know, a medical staff of 600 plus seems like a lot. Uh, to me, that seems like we have a lot of experience that we can cover a lot of different elements. And we have cardiologists, we have family medicine, we have a vast array of PCPs in our community, we have neurology on site and in the community, we have a robust OB program, uh, hematology, oncology, we've recruited three new physicians, a nurse practitioner in the past year it, to complement our radiation oncology center, which is on campus, um, which we feel like will give us a competitive advantage. Orthopedics I just spoke to, uh, Otolaryngology, it's ENT, uh, pediatrics, neonatology, podiatry, you kind of get the picture. There's not a lot that we can't handle here, uh, and that's really our argument. Why go to Boston if we can handle it here? You know, there's that 5% that you need that really highly specialized care where it doesn't make sense for us to in, invest in a surgeon who's only going to do a procedure once a year. You know, we want to keep competency up. We want them to be busy and practicing and, and keeping those skills strong. But we also have high, you know, very strong partnerships with our EMS providers, MedFlight. We can get, we can turn a patient around in 20 minutes and get them to Boston if, you know, they present with something that's really that, 
um, catastrophic. So, you know, kind of complementing that, we've really received some awards and recognitions that I think are, are worthy of highlighting. Um, I won't go through all of them, but LeapFrog A and uh, patient safety, we just were awarded that in um, early November. So, you know, everything that we're doing is really rooted in patient safety, quality of care, and the patient experience. So that's our, our forever mission. You never really accomplish that, but you just continue to strive to do better and better and better. Uh, I think this designation uh, from the LeapFrog group is really symbolic of that effort, and we can, you know, we really look forward to continuing to uh, drive those LeapFrog A's. The Joint Commission Gold Seal, that's for our orthopedic program. Um, we look at that as a real feather in our cap because not a lot of programs actually go after this. New England Baptist hasn't pursued this. They probably don't have to because of their, uh, their name brand. But for us, we want to show to our patients and to our community that we take this seriously. And this is a way that we can do that. Um, just jumping down to the bottom, the baby friendly designation is another kind of component part of our program that distinguishes us. Baby friendly is a designation levied by the World Health Organization in conjunction with UNICEF, which really demonstrates that we have a commitment to breastfeeding. Um, the evidence shows that that is healthy. It can be a little, uh, you know, discussion point, and I won't get into my own personal feelings and what my wife did, but, you know, uh, I think committing to that and being able to consistently achieve it year over year has really been a, a positive thing for us, and it's given us an identity within that maternity subset uh, and, and a framework that we can really drive forward. So, you know, what does our patient population look like? Uh, we look at things in terms of our primary service area, which is a, a geographic area defined as the zip codes in which 75% of your patients, both inpatient and outpatient, come from. So, I mean, clearly, we're highly dense. There's a high density right around Brockton. No real surprise there. Um, our secondary service area kind of takes that primary service area and adds 15%. So within the blue region, we get 90% of our business, essentially. Um, our campus is kind of spread out. We have our main campus here in the middle. We have Northeastern. We have sur an ambulatory surgery center that does orthopedics, podiatry, uh, breast care. We also have a, a full service mammography, women's health, um, group there with 3D um, mammography capabilities, really cutting edge. We have PCP practices throughout the entire area. We have an MRI in East Bridgewater. We have um, Brockton Neighborhood Health. We have some radiology modalities there. So we have a nice kind of smattering across and then NORCAP Lodge and Foxborough. But really, um, this is really what it's all about. It's our community. The, the unique thing about community medicine and, and having a system that's rooted in the community is that your patients are your neighbors. They're your family members. They're your employees. They're your business leaders. They're your employees. Um, and, you know, that adds a very personal note to what we do because you can have a patient who comes in one day and then you see them in the grocery store or you see them at church or you see them walking down the street. You can't really run from anything. It's very personal which we think is a very good thing because it allows us to create those bonds. Um, you know, sometimes if you go into Boston, you're just a number. You come, you go, and you never go back, which could be fine. <laughs> Probably in a lot of cases is. But we take this very seriously. And, you know, our identity as a Metro South business um, and Metro South member is really important to us. And, you know, ultimately, our region is your region. Our, our PSA and our, our primary service and secondary service areas are almost identical to the Metro South region. So, you know, we are one. And, you know, what, uh, what I'd like you to take away from today is that we want to be your premier regional health care choice. Uh, we don't want there to be a question. When, when you need something, we're here for you. And that's our commitment to you today and going forward. So that's uh, kind of... Good Samaritan in a nutshell, a very 30,000 foot view. So I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Stewart Healthcare, our, our parent company, uh, which has really undergone tremendous, tremendous growth and evolution over the past 10 years. Can you give me a 
from running out of time, Chris, just give me a little. Um, you know, we started with six hospitals in 2010. We grew from 2012 to uh, 10 campuses in Massachusetts. We've expanded into Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida. We did that last year with um, acquiring eight more hospitals, 110 clinics. And then this year, we've expanded into our western region, which uh, has added 18 hospitals and a variety of clinics. So we've really gone from the small, essentially bankrupt group of six hospitals to be a thriving, integrated healthcare delivery system that's international. In addition to these, we have um, we operate hospitals, uh, public hospitals in, in Malta, which is a new endeavor for us as well. So our model is one in which we partner with investors, whether it be um, private wealth management or uh, real estate investment trust. We have a partner, uh, Medical Properties Trust, that essentially is our um, capital and land partner. So we work with them and we operate as, uh, as their tenants, essentially. But you know, where we kind of are now as a system is we've grown, we have the portfolio, and now what we're doing is really focusing in on the value proposition. So how can we really integrate our different models? So our hospitals, our network, which is our accountable care organization, all of our managed care contracts, all the progressive kind of payment systems that uh, started with Obamacare and continue. Because, I mean, we have, we acknowledge that we have a real problem in terms of healthcare reimbursement. Stewart has been really on the cutting edge of accepting that and saying, okay, if this isn't going to be the model, what is, and how do we embrace it, how do we thrive in it, and how do we push it? So that's, you know, where we are. And I think in the next few years, that value proposition is going to become more and more sophisticated, but it's going to become more and more important to the consumer uh, where we're going to be really driving this and you're going to see it. And your employees will see it. And our, all of our patients will see it. And they'll see the value of coming to Good Sam versus uh, any of the alternatives. So in closing, uh, just two kind of picture slides here. Our 50 years, so our, our kind of our tagline here, 50 years of amazing people caring for others. And um, we're going to be doing a celebration this month. We actually have eight employees and three physicians who have been with us since 1968. And we're going to be recognizing those 11 folks uh, to kind of capstone this year. We've really had a tremendous year. We have this 50-year uh, wall up here. It's really been a, a nice thing for our employees to really get behind this and celebrate it. It's been a cultural kind of thing for us to really get engagement. Um, Mayor Carpenter was here earlier in the year. He gave us a designation. We had a 50-year cake. And it was, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> they ate that pretty quickly. Uh, but it's really, this has been, this is really what it's about. And as we move forward, we want to make sure that our roots are <coughs> firmly entrenched in this hill as we move forward so we can deliver another 50 years of care to this community. And then uh, our last slide here is our leapfrog game. Bring your A game every day. So this is kind of our battle cry. Let's keep this quality designation. Let's keep continue to keep quality as our focus as we care for one another and we care for our community. So with that, happy holidays. And it's a pleasure to have you all here. And we have questions or... No we save the questions for the end if we have questions. Thank you. And there's still some of that 50 year old cake out there next to the <laughs> 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 Not true. It's remiss to uh, this breakfast, obviously, is brought to us by Stewart, but it's also being sponsored by Cambridge Savings Bank. So let's give a round of applause for you. Matt, one year before you uh, talk a little bit with Chris, I have a little gift here too. Here you go, Matt. Thanks. Thanks, so, in the essence of time, we'll move right ahead and we'll get you out of here as close to nine as we can. Uh, now, it is my pleasure to introduce Caitlin McGillicuddy, Director of Children's Museum in Easton. As the newly appointed Executive Director of the Children's Museum of Easton, Caitlin has led the museum through its largest physical update in nearly 10 years. 
She is charting course to solidify the museum as an innovative and creative educational and community resource. I got a bunch of stuff here more that's, that says she's doing a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> For the interest of time, I'm going to ask uh, Caitlin to come on up. Give a round of applause. because I did my presentation in incorrect format. So I have this keyboard, and I also am going to compensate by turning on my lights. <laughs> Are these distracting? <laughs> is, that, is that better? All right, I'll just go with the solid. OK. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I am very pleased to be here at the Good Samaritan Medical Center, who is a fabulous supporter of the museum. Um, and uh, thank you to this fabulous table of supporters of mine in the museum. We've got a table for four members here today. Um, and just in terms, before I get started, I'll just say that I have had, because um, Good Samaritan is a supporter of the museum, the very good fortune of using the Da Vinci robot myself because they brought it to the museum this summer for kids to try it. It was super cool. Um, it is exactly like a video game, um, and it made me feel like I could be a doctor. So, so I'm going to just, this is my first time um, actually at a Metro West event, or South event. I don't know why I always do that. But um, so hopefully what I wanted to do with my time that I have with the group today is I want to tell you about what's going on at the museum. I want to tell you a little bit about me because I'm new to this group. I'm like, don't read ahead. Um, and that was my fault. Um, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit of the thought process behind the changes that are happening at the museum, just because we are a room full of small business people, um, and a little bit of like how I've been thinking about the, the steps that I've been taking at the museum I thought could benefit you. Um, even if they're completely different experiences or business models, there's always the opportunity. I know when I'm listening to someone to talk to be like, oh, that's just like this, but not, and now I have a new idea. So hopefully, um, you'll learn a bit about the museum, but it might help you bring something back to whatever challenges you are facing. So, um, and I'm going to try and move quickly. Um, so, a little bit about me, because I'm kind of new to this area. Um, I just actually moved to this area from the South Shore. So, I grew up in Marshfield. Um, I went to Simmons. Um, and during my time at Simmons, I had the incredible good fortune of starting my career at Dana-Farber, working in administration as a student. Um, that is a place that is incredibly near and dear to me. I started working um, there in administration, then I launched my official career there working in the sarcoma clinic um, in direct patient care for a number of years, and then shifted into fundraising at the Jimmy Fund, which is how I kind of became the full career nonprofit gal that I am today. Um, I spent a long time working at an organization called Crossroads, which was formerly Crossroads for Kids. It works with young people in Boston and Brockton. Some of them are here today and surprised me, and I almost cried. Menos and DeAndre are here. They were like my babies, and now they're running the Brockton YMCA, which is amazing. Um, so I spent a long time there working with the president of that organization, growing that organization from raising $700,000 a year to when I left $2.3 million. Um, so we really grew that organization, Go Crossroads. Um, another organization that's near and dear to my heart. Some of the titles I've held, development director, communications director, strategic planner. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm a mommy of two girls and three pets. Um, a, a wife. I'm a former drama kid and singer. Um, <laughs> I'm a writer. And I wear sparkly eyeshadow. So you can see it makes sense that I now run a children's museum. I am where I'm meant to be. Um, before we begin this little speech here I'm going to give, I just was wondering if you could raise your hand if you knew there was a children's museum in Easton. Oh, great. OK, now raise your hand if you've been to the children's museum in Easton. Now put your hand down if you work there or you're a board member. No, wait. OK. All right, that's still good. All right, good data points for me. So. I'll tell you a little bit about the museum. Um, this is the museum. I put a filter on it because everyone likes to look pretty. So um, the museum was founded in the early 90s by a group of moms that were looking for hands-on play experiences for their kids. Um, it's housed in the historic fire station in northeastern Massachusetts. So if you haven't been and you are into things like that, you should just come for that because it's pretty cool. Uh, we have about 50,000 visitors annually. Um, who are coming through our doors to participate at the museum. And then we serve an additional 8,000 in the community through our mobile outreach and learning programs. Um, we go into schools and community centers doing um, hands-on science programming for, for kids primarily grades K through two. Um, we have about a $550,000 operating budget, so we're just a little bit smaller than Stewart Healthcare. And <laughs> our operating budget is about 60% earned revenue, 40% um, fundraising for now. 
Um, nearly 90, every year we give about $90,000 worth of value services to the community. So we offer um, free memberships to DCF, um, free, um, we're part of the uh, Blue Star Military Program. Um, we offer free programming for social workers and foster services and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, so that's valued annually at about $90,000 for us. Um, you can purchase a membership to the museum for $125. That's an ACM reciprocal membership, which means you get it 50% um, off at like Boston Children's Museum, Providence Children's Museum, Acton Children's Museum, and a bunch of other museums around the country. Um, or you can pay $9 admission, um, and under one is free. So that's part of our earned revenue. Um, we have four full-time staff three part-time staff, you know, regular part-time staff, and then a bunch of hourly staff members who are behind the front desk working birthday parties. That was one of the fabulous things I networked with with this lovely gentleman over there. I need some more young, vibrant staff who want to run birthday parties. Um, <laughs> we have a board of directors, a board of advisors, some of whom are here today. Thank you for coming. Um, and that is the museum in a nutshell. Um, so when I took over <coughs> the museum, in February, I took it over from one of the founders, Paula Peterson, probably a lot of you in here know her. Um, the museum had just celebrated its 25th anniversary and she bestowed upon me this lovely gem um, that she had been leading and taking good care of for 25 years. So when I came in, I was the fresh set of eyes. Um, everybody who works at the museum um, had been working there for at least seven years. So I was literally the fresh set of eyes coming in and taking a look at, you know, all right, what are we going to do? How are we going to, how are we going to charge forward into the future? So, um, there are a couple of things that I noticed right away. And the first thing that I noticed was that I came into the museum as the only person working at the museum who had kids in the age range that we were serving. So that meant that I was seeing things that I was like, oh, oh, yep, 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 yep. I was kind of like, if anybody, I think I described it as, um, that movie, um, Up. The movie up where the dog is talking to squirrel. I was like squirreling, right? I said that to you. All over the place. Like, wait, oh, wait, 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 we got to change this. So um, the, th the three big things that I noticed as a result of, of having that kind of unique um, perspective on the team was that we needed to know our audience a little bit better. And I'm going to say the M word in a minute, which is millennials, which is millennials are becoming parents. I am an exennial, so I'm like just on the cusp. But there's a whole different ball game when it comes to um, working with millennials. Um, that we needed to do a little bit more of creating what kids today are looking for. Kids today play differently than they played 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. My kid would rather watch videos of other kids playing with toys than playing with her own toys. And that is bizarre. And this whole unboxing situation, if you don't know what that is, you can ask me. It's like videos of kids opening boxes of toys. And it's like bizarre. So the point is, Kids are changing, and we need to be making sure that we're keeping up with that. Um, and then we needed to do a little bit better of communicating to our key constituents in the way that they are communicating with each other. And so those were like the three big kind of buckets of tweaks that I saw when I came in. So the first thing for us was knowing our audience, which is that millennials and exennials are primarily the parents these days. Um, and they have a different value structure. They want to be part of something as opposed to just going somewhere. Um, aesthetics and user experience is important. Millennials are, they're a connoisseur culture. They want, they don't just want their coffee, they want their coffee to be beautiful and they want to drink it in a beautiful place. Um, and when coming into the museum, it maybe looked a little old or a little broken and maybe not worthy of my investment of the thing that I want to be part of. Um, their communication style was digital. They want to be like Facebooked, maybe, maybe it's almost too old to be Facebooking, but they want to grammed and snapped and texted and all of those things. Um, and then they have different pain points, but they're also the same. So their pain points are, you know, like as a mom of a young kid, which is my market, like I'm tired, I forgot my cell phone today, my dog peed on the floor as I was trying to get out of the house, um, I'm over and under caffeinated at the same time, and, um, but I also like want to see connections with other moms, and I want to like get my kid to be playing in an old school way, but with new school ideas. I don't want my kid on a tablet all the time, but I want what my kid is playing with to be not what kids were playing with 25 years ago. So um, that was the first thing. We needed to know our audience a little bit better. Um, then we had to create that for them. So for me, the first thing that I heard a lot of was parents coming in being like, why do parents have to pay? And I could think of a million reasons why parents have to pay, but 
for me, the myth there was that, okay, millennials want to be part of something, ex millennials want, everybody wants to be part of something. So if we're just saying pay nine dollars to come in and play, they're not they're not knowing anything about the mission of the museum and what we're doing. We need to make them coming here to play just being part of the fulfillment of our mission. And as soon as we started talking about that differently, I started hearing that question a lot less. And people started to be excited about what we were doing and ask questions to become part of it. Um, we needed to refresh our exhibits and our facilities, and I'll talk a little bit in detail about that. We did just do a pretty big spruce up. Um, which was the biggest that the museum has done in a number of years. Um, and we got a lot of great support and has already changed um, our revenue trend, tre what's that word? Projection in a positive way. Um, we also needed to create more value so that we could get people there and get them coming back by creating more in-museum programs, which we've done. And we need to create it all with kids today in mind. And also the experiences of parents, because if you're a parent, and you've got two kids and they're kind of going crazy and this one wants to go in this room and this one wants to go in that room and I can't keep an eye on them and everything that's here you're not allowed to climb on and I'm just, I don't want to go back. I'm stressed out. I want to go and I want to have it to be a good experience. So we need to create those experiences in the footprint of the museum with those things in mind. And then we need to communicate about all of this. Over communicate if possible. Um, in a very nice way so that people don't unfriend us. But so some of the changes that we made right off the bat is when I arrived, we were doing um, quarterly brochures that were printed. And they were, what I noticed is like, there is something happening every single day at the museum, but we weren't telling anyone about it because we sent out our brochure two months ago and the things that we were doing hadn't been planned yet. And so all the people who were coming were like pleasantly surprised that we were doing that thing today, but we hadn't told people that we were doing that thing so that they would come for it. So we immediately shifted to doing monthly calendars versus quarterly brochures. Um, and we started sharing them via email, social, and on-site as opposed to mailed because we were mailing them before. And I don't know about you, but I'm terrible at mail and I hate it. So <laughs> I don't put, my refrigerator isn't even magnetic anymore. So it doesn't even like go up on the, it just goes on a table and then it creates stress when I throw it away. So um, we were doing postcards. We, we shifted to postcards to let people know we're not going to send these anymore. Go follow us so you can see the real-time information. Um, and we also started using all of our social media for letting people know about what was happening as opposed to primarily prior, we had used social media to highlight things that had already happened and to kind of establish thought leadership. Like we are youth, um, early childhood education, which is great. We're still doing that, but we weren't telling people you want something to do, come here and do it. Which as a mom, that's how I'm finding out what's going on and that's how I'm like finding about the Polar Express and all that stuff. So that was a huge opportunity for us. Um, we also started doing a bit more regular email communication about things happening at the museum, not just about our fundraising events. And then we also um, launched a new website and created a consistent social media presence that was a useful tool for the people who were trying to get to come to the museum. Um, before that, our, web, our website wasn't really updated regularly. It was a little bit clunky and we couldn't figure out how to use it. I couldn't integrate anything and, and so people were kind of getting stuck. And then, you, you know, people were like goldfish. We have like two seconds of attention and then they're on to the next thing. Um, and all along, we were kind of setting a new brand tone of kind of being more familiar and, and talking to parents like, we see you, we get you, come here and play. And the next thing that we did, is we started looking at um, partnerships for the museum. So. What we were doing before was we had two big fundraisers. We had the, the Father's Day Road Race and our craft beer fundraiser. And then we did a few seasonal things like be a sponsor of December, be a sponsor of uh, the Spring Sensations. Um, what I wanted to do was actually create the opportunity for businesses and um, supporters of the museum to be part of who we are and what we were doing, um, to be part of our programming, hence Good Samaritan bringing the Da Vinci robot to us. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh my God. This is what I was doing. That's what okay. I saw. So I saw my Facebook. All right. If you get any text messages, I'll read them out loud. Thank you. <laughs> 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 text me now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I want to go there for lunch. All right. So, um, I wanted to take the time to create more of a partnership feeling for the people who are supporting the museum, and I had the very good luck of Good Samaritan Medical Center inviting me in to talk about expanding our <laughs> partnership at the exact time that I was thinking about this. And the result was um, me going in and talking with fabulous Nikki, who's one I know on, and um, 
and talking about like what was her, what is it, what is Good Samaritan trying to achieve, and what am I trying to achieve, and where can we meet in the middle so that we can create a mutually beneficial partnership um, that will help me bring the museum to the next level and launch this new approach for fundraising. And I was incredibly blessed that they understood what I was saying and said yes. Um, and so this past summer, Good Samaritan was our first seasonal presenting sponsor of our summer extravaganza. And it was amazing, and it was kind of like the, yes, Caitlin, we see what you're trying to do, this makes sense, um, we're gonna hop on board and we're gonna help kind of blaze the trail forward for the museum in this way. It was huge. Um, what we did was we identified a few programs and opportunities, I had some really cute pictures of them, where the Good Samaritan um, came in and they ran a teddy bear clinic and kids brought their clinic and there were the medical staff there helping kids you know, treat the wounds of their teddy bears and they brought, we did a really awful program, it was great, about bacteria, where they put the glow in the dark blue, goo on your hands and you had to go wash your hands and see how germs stay and I was like washing my hands like forever because it wasn't coming off and it made me realize how germy everything is. Um, and then they brought the Da Vinci robot which was amazing and that was really really cool because um, we got a lot of older kids who came to that which is a, a focus of us expanding the, the reach of our programs. Um, all right, so in this, or in this approach, we're doing a lot of celebrating and a lot of thanking, um, and a lot of also improving people's understanding of what the mission is of the museum, which is a big plus for us. Um, another thing that we did in November, uh, which was something that I had been kind of stewing in my brain since I started in February, was this idea of a 25 Days of Thanks campaign because the museum is incredibly um, supported in the community. That's one thing that I noticed as soon as I arrived, that people were excited to meet me, excited to hear about the museum, and excited to be part of the next phase of the museum. And small businesses um, have been enormously supportive of everything that I've been trying to do. Am I done? Am I out of time? Oh my god, okay, so anyway. Uh, don't I get extra minutes for the technology kerfuffle? All right, so. Um, Every day of the month was sponsored by a different small business, and it helped us to raise uh, $5,000, which is a big amount of change for the museum. Um, we have also are looking to establish partnerships with other organizations who have like-minded missions. We've recently started a partnership with the Fuller Craft Museum. They're in the museum um, running a program every other Friday with young people. Um, it's great cross-promotion. It's helping them get a little bit more recognition in the communities where they're looking for. Um, and it helps us uh, expand the offer that we have in the museum. And um, they're going to be starting that weekly, actually, starting in February, which is really great. So I just want to tell you really quickly the impact of these small tweaks, which is um, we did a huge spruce up in September. We basically touched every single inch of the museum except for one room, which was the one room I was asked about today. We have done that. But... Um, <laughs> The result is that from September to November, we saw a 35% increase in membership revenue, which is huge for us. That represents $5,100 more in, that, in those three months than we raised last year. Um, we saw a 26% increase in admissions revenue, which is also huge for us. And since we've shifted this part, our, our corporate fundraising from more transactional to partnership model, we've seen a 73% increase, which is amazing. 30% of that is just in the last three months. So I have all these great pictures you can see, but now <laughs> of all the changes at the museum, so you're just going to have to come to the museum now and um, see them all. We've got a lot going on in November. Um, I'm sorry, December. We do have a lot in November too, but in December we've got Holiday is Grinch Week this week. Uh, we've got ballerinas coming to do Nutcracker stuff next Saturday. We've got Mary Poppins Palooza. All of these things are opportunities for sponsorship. For small businesses that start about $250 and what we're trying to do is really increase the way that we recognize sponsors um, with the museum community so we're doing tagged Facebook posts and signage in the museum and banners and and emails and all kinds of stuff so there are a lot of opportunities go to our website you can check them out um, and then the last thing I want a couple of things I want to just tell you about is what we're planning for the future um, and I'm going to do this really fast so we're planning to do a whole lot more sprucing we're going to um, try to continue to, to, to make improvements, to be receptive to the feedback that we're getting, and to create more value for people <laughs> to keep coming to the museum. Um, next year, we're starting to roll out programs 
to serve a wider age range of young people. So we're looking, you know, we have a very limited footprint, we're in a historic building, but we can offer programs for especially that tween age range um, is what we're looking at first, after school programming, Friday night craft clubs, things like that. Programs that are really gonna actually support um, the prevention of risky behavior development, which is what we're looking to do. Um, we're also expanding our programs that serve special populations. So we have a program that specifically right now serves autism and families with autism, including the siblings. Um, where there's private play duties and is closed. Um, but we're going to be looking for other ways that we can support um, special and unique populations in that way. We are always on the hunt for new partners, like our partnership with the Fuller Craft Museum, um, Good Samaritan Medical Center, where we can also just offer more cool things. Um, so if you have something, come and talk to me. We're like, there's, there's something for everybody. Um, we're also really, really, and this is the, the, the nonprofit fundraiser girl in me, I am really actively looking for funding so that some of these, ex, these enrichment programs that we run, um, we can offer them for free for under-resourced populations as opposed to having people try and find $300 to have us come in. Um, those dollars could be spent in lots and lots and lots of ways and they are very, 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 very few. So I'm, I'm actively looking for funding so that we can offer more um, free services to the community. And then we're going to be doing quite a bit more strategic planning in terms of charting the growth of the museum. Who are we going to be? Um, where are we going to go? Will we have a new building? Will we not have a new building? Can we be the new Boston? Probably not. So who are we going to be? Um, and what is the experience that we want families to have when they come? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Great job. <laughs> so if you haven't been on the website, uh, and I did just go on there just to get some notes, uh, there are five movies you should watch with your kids. Toy Story, Star Wars, Wizard of Oz, E.T., and my personal favorite, Mary Poppins. So if you have kids, grandkids, you know, take some time this uh, holiday season to see if you can uh, sit down and watch that with them.